you probably have seen my part one video I the link is down below um, it covers general naval terminology and we have a take a look uh, in, quickly into US Navy carrier history until the Nimitz class and then we also cover several things about the uh, carrier operations like carrier strike group or carrier battle group arrangement and several um, wars involved with the carrier strike group so in this video we will go deeper into the Nimitz class uh, carrier itself we will discuss more toward the systems uh, on the carrier and also uh, cover several more details I guess in terms of how it works uh, what it features and yeah so hopefully it might give more information about uh, the super carrier itself hi everyone um in this video we're gonna delve deeper into the module itself and also learning about uh, its systems and the uh, super carrier and we probably will focus on several uh, key features of the super carrier itself and related to the DCS super carrier model we're going to start with uh, several general guidelines which is the marking itself so start from the bow area there is a CVN numbers here I'm using CVN 72 Abraham Lincoln as the as an example so there's a, a bit faint marking here uh, 72 so this is the CPN 72 that is assigned to Abraham Lincoln the other important uh, marking basically several lines and uh, you know paints in the in the deck uh, showing uh, this is a landing platform uh, angle deck so there's a white lines uh, very prominent so you won't miss it and the center line covered with yellow and, uh, and white line stripe uh, there are several faint uh, marking here you cannot see so I put a, a bit of uh, on top of it is a dotted line um, basically it's uh, indicating a safe line uh, safe uh, safe shot line meaning that um, if you spot your aircraft not park but spot uh, spotting in meaning you know, that you park your aircraft somewhere here don't cross this line because it's it's basically unsafe right either for landing so this is uh, also uh, the marking also um, used for landing fall line meaning that if you land beyond this line is definitely not allowed or if there's some obstructions the the landing uh, uh, deck or the platform is not safe so uh, it's full so you cannot land basically if there's some protruding uh, airplane or the previous one that or just landed haven't really get out from this uh, landing phone line so uh, the LSOs uh, can say um, the landing are uh, the landing deck are full meaning that uh, the next aircraft cannot land or have to wave off and turn turn around again so this landing fall line is the most important one so during landing sequence uh, nothing's really beyond this line or entering this area either what uh, equipments or aircraft yeah so if there's something within this line uh, the landing is full okay the next important uh, line marking line is basically the safe shot line uh, this is for cat 2 cat 1 and cat 3 uh, for cat 2 means that if you want to park some aircraft around this area this is uh, the line that's not supposed to be exceeded by the park or spotted airplane here yeah so if uh, that means the catapult 2 is functional and uh, this is the safe line that the park or the spotted airplane here 
should not exit so it can be safely catapult the airplane here safely cut up without you know damaging any park or spotted aircraft here uh, also vice versa this is the safe shot line for catapult 2 meaning that uh, if we want to oh sorry the safe shot line for cat 1 uh, vice versa this is the safe shot line for catapult 1 meaning that if we park the aircraft this area uh, then we can use the catapult one, right? So this is the safe marking where aircraft can be safely parked here while we use the catapult one. So this one is for cat one, this one is for cat two. So just to mark uh, uh, how far the spotted air, uh, aircraft here uh, can be uh, before, you know, uh, making a further risk for the launch aircraft from catapult one using this shape sort line for catapult one similar with for catapult three uh, this is the the maximum area or uh, yeah for spotting aircraft if let's say there will be a lot of aircraft park or spotted here uh, it cannot exit this line before it make it dangerous for launching from catapult three Okay, so there's several marking. Uh, the other marking is actually this dotted line here, a bit orange, I think, yellow orange. Uh, this one uh, denoting uh, the elevators or moving platform. Also, this one can be moved. And this one is can. This I think is a uh, armament elevators uh, to bring up the armory from down below on the from the storage. Yeah, so this one is uh, another elevator and this one is for jet blast deflectors so it can move also yeah so that's why a dotted marking uh, in yellow uh, to mark some movable platform okay so that's general marking for the aircraft carrier another important uh, aspect is the spotting area aka parking area basically we said spotting area in carrier rather than park so spotting area uh, have several locations basically. So uh, you don't put usually you don't put airplane in the elevators until the last uh, one being brought up into the deck. So if it's last one is okay, but if it's not, you're gonna block uh, um, basically the the aircraft to be put into the flight deck. In DC super carrier, it means that you cannot spawn. Uh, this is a spawn point uh, for uh, DTS uh, AI, let's say, aircraft. Um, uh, so you don't block usually this elevator. So there's several area from, let's say start from the bow, starboard bow, there's a point here. Uh, usually this uh, spotting area occupied when there's a recovery activity and then you uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, probably you don't want to launch again and there's no further launch cycle, so you can put over there. So it's definitely going to block uh, Catapult 1. Uh, and then similar with this, uh, you're going to block Catapult 2. So if you use this both area, it will block Catapult 1, Catapult 2, definitely. So let's say for an end of the day, uh, from the recovery cycle, and then you put the aircraft into that area. Uh, the main common um, spotting is actually in this area, including coral, the street, and the six pack. Uh, I think it can accommodate around six, uh, I forget, but this one is I think around five, four, five, and then I think it was around two or three if it's, if it's really uh, parked tightly, uh, but uh, f during, you know, trying to ready the, uh, for the launch cycle, it usually it has been spread out into several area. The junkyard also usually occupied by SREF, uh, I think a big aircraft like E2, for example. E2 can be parked here or here usually in the real life and helicopter around this area. Although it's never said, but uh, yeah, it, there's no name here, but usually a helicopter can be parked here. Um, there's another area here, a small one sometimes can be parked for helicopter in this tight corner or with several air aircraft of course 
uh, if you block the elevator here. Can be. A, uh, I've tried two big aircraft here, the E2 and the uh, S3 over here. Uh, but yeah, in in real life, usually it's you know jet fighters or uh, attack fighters. For for example, it can be put here. Three of them, for example. Uh, this is another elevator. You don't want to block it, or except if it's the last uh, aircraft to be brought into the flight deck. And uh, this is the patio. Uh, I think we can put around three. In real life, it could be four, I guess, if it's really tight, tightly parked against each other. Uh, yeah. So this is the patio. So this is the area. While it's actually opening up the the landing platform uh, angled deck landing platform uh, with this kind of arrangements in real life when we beginning the um, the operations carry operations uh, let's say in the morning or preparations or the, for the first uh, launch cycle you can occupy several aircraft over here actually because nobody is gonna land anyway uh, so because nobody is going to recover uh, uh, landing, basically. Um, we, we can put several aircraft here ready for taxi to catapult to N4, for example. Uh, yeah, so we can fully occupy this area too. Uh, unfortunately, uh, current DCS supercarrier uh, has a limited simulation and control on how to spot the aircraft. So we cannot just set, hey, you park here, you park there. Um, because the AI aircraft, especially not the static object, static object, of course, you can put, you know, whatever you want uh, during the mission editing. But the AI aircraft, uh, I don't know. I haven't really found on how to assign the AI aircraft to certain locations, for example. It would be nice if you can just put using the similar way, uh, like putting the AI static object, but then it was an uh, AI uh, um you know, control aircraft. So unfortunately, we cannot do that. So sometimes they just randomly or logic uh, based on the logic, certain logic, basically uh, putting the aircraft in certain location. So uh, I've tried, for example, if I want to put the S2 and uh, the E2 and S3 uh, to be here, for example, I have to block this um, with some static object, this elevator, and they will go here, basically. Um, or and I don't know how to uh, to push them here for example probably it's too tight for them uh, I'm not sure but yeah uh, I haven't really found uh, how to put the E3 and S2 in this area for example uh, another thing is if I don't arrange it if I don't block here the S, uh, S3 and E2 will be here right and the, the other AI will blo uh, almost block the path for E2 and S3 here. So there's a lot of uh, FA18C here. So when I want this one to start first, it, it won't be able to come out. <laughs> it's stuck in this area. So even like it moves a bit and then stuck. So those kind of things are um, during mission editing or creating a like a sequence, for example. Um, yeah, we have to be careful in terms of where they are and how they they are, they are working. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot really fine tuning it in in the mission editor at this moment. Hopefully, yeah, Eagle Dynamics hear us and do something different. I guess to arrange the AI aircraft so we can simulate a jam pack situation, for example, uh, where everyone is parking neck, uh, uh, shoulders to, to shoulders between the aircraft, but still it works, right? So. And totally not today. Okay, the next one is we talk about elevators. So there are four elevators. Uh, this is the first elevators uh, in the starboard side. Um, and then the second elevator is also in the starboard side uh, further off. And then the third elevator is in almost uh, uh, half of the island. Uh, and then the fourth elevators in the port side uh, next to the third elevator. So this four elevator can transport at least two aircraft uh, like uh, FA-18C or even Tomcat fully loaded 
so it's very powerful um, based on the article I guess the elevator one is rarely used because it's too close I guess to the catapult one and you know it's obstructing the operation of catapult one anyway so they rarely use the first elevator and usually use for the spotting area so this elevator if you see from the starboard view of the aircraft uh, there is a big door that can be opened there's a very thick steel door to protect uh, you know like a uh, bomb blast or something from the side of the ship but when it's lowered it will open right and then aircraft can come out and then uh, put uh, and put it top side uh, based on the elevators using the elevators uh, and then uh, yeah this is the second elevators almost a midship and then the third elevators in almost uh, further off uh, toward the stern so this is the front the bow and the stern and uh, this one the fourth elevators in the port quarter view let's say uh, it's similar uh, you know shape of the other elevators just in the port side and this one the example uh, the photo of uh, the elevator bringing up to uh, uh, FA-18C on it to be um, to be put into the flight deck another elevator actually uh, armament elevators as I mentioned this is a small elevators to bring up the armory like the bombs missiles from the storage below down below so yeah there's several spots i guess uh, and when you park your aircraft here you can bring the armory here uh, or you can most of the parking uh, or the spotting is in this area the armory will be brought up here and several uh this one is for the uh, further off uh aircraft position i guess to be to be supplied let's say when during um, you know recovery and then relaunch again for another missions so it will be quicker okay and the next important one is the catapults uh, uh usually called fat cat or just cat you know uh, catapults is the the mechanisms that really pull your aircraft uh, speeding up this only like 300 uh, feet uh, platform to achieve uh, to arrive with uh, a takeoff speed required takeoff speed uh, this is the catapult one or cat one this is cat two uh, this is called bow catapult because in a in the bow area and then catapult three and cat cat four catapult four this is the waist catapult so in, um, in uh, a midship locations uh, this is um, we call it uh, so during the launch sequence uh, the hook lowered uh, but before sorry before uh, the hook lowered uh, we uh, the technician will install they call it a repeatable release hold back bar so hold back bar function as just to hold back the aircraft uh, when in the launch sequence uh, the pilot put the thrust into full afterburner for example the aircraft won't move forward right so it will hold back until let's say the the trigger or the launch button push by the shooter uh, which will uh, provide the steam um, um, pressures pressurized steam which move this uh, catapult shuttle uh, rushing away in this rail right so that pressures will break the linkage inside not mechanically break it but it can be reused it's just that under pressure certain uh, certain mechanism inside the holdback bar will release the catch into the the undercarriage so it will release aircraft basically and because of the high pressure of the shuttle it will rail the the aircraft speeding up the the catapult rail into let's say a minimum 100 uh, 30 something uh, knots uh, airspeed for example so this is the catapult shuttle it will speeding up this rail uh, it's 
very powerful forces uh, duck your aircraft uh, into a very high speed uh, takeoff required. And once uh, it's uh, the aircraft takeoff, it will roll back into the initial position, start position again, and uh, start again the sequence. So this just a transition, uh, putting some probably some um, lubricants uh, to take care of the maintenance of the shuttle, incredible shuttle. So the hold back bar, um, yeah, it's, it's the function is really important because uh, it's set up. It can be set up. Let's say for heavier aircraft, it will it will break uh, or it will open basically or release the catch. Uh, with certain forces, right? So, because uh, heavier aircraft will require higher pressures uh, from the steam, uh, catapult steam uh, pressure uh, to launch that aircraft. The more heavier, the, the higher pressures of the catapult steam required to push the shuttles moving forward. So yeah, it's, it is adjustable. I think if you see the movie from launching in the catapult, Early days, uh, they don't use this holdback bar, but they use certain wires or brittle, brittle. Yeah, so it's called brittle because it's it's uh, wire at, uh, or cable attached to certain points of the aircraft, rather than using hook and this holdback bar. So this is the catapult. Uh, yeah. So basically, this is the most important uh, part when we launching the aircraft. Uh, the the next one uh, related to the catapult is the catapult controller. You know the the one who launch uh, or trigger the opening of the valve, uh, so the the pressurized steam can push the the catapult shuttle uh, railing away the aircraft into takeoff speed. So where they are actually, they are inside this bubble. They call it a catapult controller room underneath the, the flight deck. So they are. Um, slightly below the flight deck in a, you call it a dome, like a bubble. They call it bubble. So usually occupied, so this one is the bubble uh, for uh, for the bow uh, catapult. So it's like, a it can be lowered actually uh, and stored, uh, but it uh, usually when it's uh, used, it was raised like this and at least two people occupied this uh, uh, bubbles. One is actually the catapult and resting officers, and the other one is safety officers. Both are quite usually rank quite high. So once they work, they they way out from the uh, worker on top of the flight deck into certain ranks. They they can achieve uh, the ranks of certain like yeah certain ranks. I guess I forgot the the rank. I think first petty officer. First, first class petty officers, I forgot. So basically, yeah, I think the highest rank of the petty officers, they can occupy these bubbles. And also a lieutenant, actually, for this one is a lieutenant uh, rank for catapult arresting officer. So uh, they work together. Uh, let's say the flight deck crew here tell uh, the, the people inside or the safety officers uh, information about the weight of the aircraft that they're going to be launched. So based on the weight, uh, the either catapult arresting officer will call the panel operator in uh, further below deck uh, when the steam pressurized steam engine setting can be adjusted, and that panel operator will adjust the steam pressures to uh, accommodate the the weight of the aircraft to be launched. Now that, uh, and then tell back to the safety officer that it's been set up properly, and the safety officer will tell the personal, uh, uh, sorry, the catapult arresting officers that it's ready. And catapult arresting officer will look around. Um, uh, once everything has ready, and the flight deck crew has give a sign, uh, another look around for risks, you know, any risks uh, before launch, because he's the one gonna be responsible if something happens, because he, He's the one who's pushing the trigger basically uh, to launch the aircraft. So yeah, so once uh, it's everything okay, uh, then the catapult resting officer will push, uh, push the, the trigger buttons and release the valve basically and uh, the catapult shuttle will rail the or tuck the aircraft into takeoff speed. So yeah, so that's how they do it in, in this bubbles. 
the other, the other bubble is actually in the waist side of the ship in the port side uh, so this one is facing catapult 3 and 4 uh, similar uh, setup here to personnel and but it's responsible for launching uh, the aircraft from catapult 3 and 4 so this is just to show you how the catapult work um, I don't want to copy someone else work but again uh, it's uh, the the catapult in Nimitz class is C13 mod 1 or mod 2 the mod 2 is higher spec basically it can uh, push 80,000 pounds aircraft to 140 knots in only within the 300 feet uh, you know distance which is actually take less than three seconds basically um, if you want to see the video there's a link here I will I'll give the link below uh, so you can visit uh, and then watch the video. It's very uh, very good information there um, the, There's a pressurized steam uh, Reservoir where uh, you know, this is a very high pressure steam uh, Contained in this tank for example and there's a setting point where it released the, um, or, uh, Like a pressurized regulator which can be set up by the operator in the uh, catapult uh, control uh, uh, or uh, engine room uh, basically it will set up the certain pressure and when the launch button uh, was, uh, and when sorry uh, let's say uh, the the undercarriers uh, are hooked into the catapult shuttle there's a piston here inside this uh, cylinder uh, which is uh, attached to the catapult shuttle right so the hook will be attached to the catapult shuttle and this pistons will tuck basically the undercarriage of the aircraft uh, into certain speed so how to do that basically when it launch button or the shooter press this it will release the pressure right into the cylinder and it will push this piston forward right so basically it will push with certain pressures uh, so that translates to speed of the catapult shuttle uh, which is you know take with that hook and the uh, piston will enter uh, what you call water break and slow down and then it's there's a cable which can pull this piston back into the starting position and repeat the process so the next uh, important parts of the aircraft is jet blast deflectors GBD uh, this one is used to deflect the high uh, thrust, high power thrust from the aircraft, uh, especially when it's uh, at afterburner uh, position. You know, if, if there's no GBD here or GBD here, it will the thrust or the high power thrust will damage you know aircraft here or even throw people out uh, quite and hurting them quite badly because it's so powerful uh, the jet blast so the the jet blast deflectors um, basically deflect the powerful thrust up uh, uh, so it's uh, do not damage any aircraft or you know hurt people uh, in this area if not they're gonna have to park away from this uh, catapult right or even here so you cannot use even this area so that's another reason is that if you want to use this area let's say to spot an aircraft here safely without disrupting the the launch sequence the, the, you need a gbd here right the other uh, the other uh, uh, the third one uh, the third reason basically you can ready it uh, almost um, the second aircraft ready to launch around here uh, safely because uh, the gbd will protect uh, the, the the blast from the jet here uh, not to affect uh, the second aircraft ready in this area so yeah that's the GBD uh, the it was a very uh, sturdy or very um, durable constructions usually created by concrete and metal structures with active cooling so they have to provide a water cooling here using seawater circulated so they can cool the this uh, uh, GBD actively I think the latest one they try to make it from ceramic and metal structure so they can replace it if it's damaged but it it has a passive cooling the the active cooling is okay but it's 
basically created a lot of maintenance breakdowns and yeah so it's it's not very ideal situation in the aircraft carrier to have a lot of maintenance and breakdown when they are out of in the uh, ocean uh, the material here the gbd it's have ha it ha itself has to be able to withstand almost like 60 second 600 degree you know idle idle thrust or in fahrenheit and 60 second uh, uh, up to 2230 degree fahrenheit on military thrust like that's quite a long right and 30 second uh, 3100 or two almost 200 3200 degree fahrenheit after burner thrust for 30 second and then another 60 second after burner to idle thrust cancel sequence so if it's canceled there's another six around 60 second where uh, uh, uh very hot uh, powerful thrust uh, have to be withstand and they have to withstand also a lot of uh, flying debris and everything because it's uh, it could hit this gbd and damage it if it if it's not uh, made very durable so yeah this gbd is very uh, very very durable um uh, part of the constructions so another important uh, system uh, in aircraft carrier of course the arresting cable slide uh, and then uh, Fresnel lens optical landing system and the LSO station so this one is definitely for landing right or recovery cycle so once you launch aircraft of course sometimes they have uh, of course after after a certain period they have to go back and land back into the aircraft so because they cannot land anywhere else especially out in the in in a very huge ocean uh, so this is the only w platform or a land bay, uh, base uh, air base that they can go back right so they have to recover so that is the most uh, difficult part basically uh, for uh, takeoff is quite easy basically but uh, landing or recovering uh, back into the aircraft is very very uh, stressful and even in I, I read in the article uh, it's one of the stressful moment after you know dropping a bomb or entering an enemy territory um, the, the second next most stressful condition is basically recovering back to your aircraft so, uh, because not only because it's very difficult especially night recovery or night landing it's so dark you only you barely can see even worse when uh, uh, during bad weather for example uh, so it's very stressful condition you can miss it you can hit the platform or the fentail or the stern of the ship or yeah you can uh, miss it and then fo uh, go to the drain they call it the drain meaning that you go to the ocean uh, and so yeah so many things can happen crashing there's a lot of videos showing that uh, a failure uh, uh, arrest uh, cable arrest uh, arresting uh, process or catch in terms of the uh, recovery of the aircraft so yeah this is the most difficult part of the of the cycle so several things first yeah how do you land uh, or you you um, you recover back into aircraft by trapping the cables here yeah so you basically you you put your aircraft in certain glide sl slope specific glide slope like a cone so that's why there's uh, this optical landing system required or ICLS for example to ensure that uh, you are trapping the right cable here not any cable so this cable have four cable not you 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 don't trap the first cable uh, or has a first cable basically that's not the purpose this is just for some some of the emergency one on the outside the the, the correct one is definitely is the third one so to get the okay pass from the lso uh, a grade basically you're being graded when you land basically if you not doing properly you get a low score and you could embarrass the whole squadron uh, if one become a mockery in the in the aircraft carrier if you don't do land properly uh, let's say you are 
you missed it uh, many times. Of course, you go. First of all, you're going to delay the whole uh, landing cycle for the others, right? So the other has been waiting for several minutes. They're low on fuel, and you are uh, trying to catch a cable several times. <laughs> if it's only you, so we're going to land. It's okay, but usually it's in the traffic pattern. There's um, like uh, two or more than two aircraft actually in the waiting traffic patterns above uh, the aircraft waiting to land, right? So. They are, if you delay the cycles, you basically risk them of getting out of fuel. So uh, you have to catch up the third uh, rest, uh, rest, uh, resting cables. Uh, not the first one definitely is not rec- uh, allowed uh, or recommended. You gotta, uh, you, we, you will not get a, a, a okay pass definitely because meaning that if you tra- strap, uh, uh, trap this first cable, you are too low. You, the risk is you're gonna hit this fan tail here, or part of the deck. Uh, yeah, so that's a very dangerous uh, uh, trap uh, uh, target, right? The fourth one is not also recommended because if you miss it or you bolter, basically bolter means you you miss the trap or the hook miss the, the cables, and you have to circle around. Right? You have a very short time to recover uh, the airspeed and re- uh, turning back again. So the ideal is third one and uh, probably second one. I think it should be okay. But yeah, the ideal is third one. So this is the cable. It's I think it's a two inch wick, uh, uh, two inch thick. I think it's a two inch thick cable. And uh, this is the hook of the aircraft uh, lowered. And I think this is intruder aircraft, A six E intruder. And uh, the hook is actually gonna catch the cable. The cable actually is. Uh, is actually put higher on top of the flight deck by the spring leaf. Uh, so yeah, this is the cable uh, which is running down this um, housing and then go below the deck into the uh, arresting um, steam engine. So the the cable have uh, uh, down below is attached to a pistons. Uh, with certain counterweight systems and uh, being pressurized by steam to to put some forces. So when you your so the the tension of the cable is also can be adjusted based on the weight uh, of your aircraft. Let's say you bring back a lot of fuel or armaments, it's going to set up differently on the strength of the uh, what you call the brake, basically the b- down below. So you you have a certain force. Uh, affecting your aircraft when the hook catch this cable. Uh, if you set wrong, uh, uh, wrong, uh, let's say too high the brake uh, setting, uh, it could it could create a very abrupt stop. Either it hurts your back, like you are being like hit by a truck basically, uh, and then also it could damage the fuselage of this aircraft, right? So it can have a structural damage into this uh, aircraft. Or if you setting at too low, basically it's very dangerous because you can go overboard, uh, you know, because it's gonna break around here. If it's too low, it can end up around, almost in, into the edge of the landing platform, right? So it's, it's not, uh, so there's a calculation between your weight, your the, the weight of the aircraft, being brought back to the uh, to the la- uh, the landing cycle, and then it will set the the brake accordingly. Uh, this one is the spring leaf being put in several area to to put the cable uh, like hanging in the air on top of the flight deck, so the the hook can catch up properly in within certain height. So they, this is the technician replacing the spring leaf. I think it's getting used to and getting weaker, and then they have to replace again the spring leaf. The next uh, important system in recovery process is the FLOLS or Fresnel Lens Optical Landing Systems. So this is basically the uh, a lamp um, with a Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens effect is like a magnifier. So basically, from afar, you can really see the lights, and that's the that's the use of Fresnel lens. However, Fresnel lens, due to the magnifying effect, 
it only can be seen into certain degree angle so you cannot see uh, you know wa- a wider angle basically so that's why once you get into the groove for example and reaching the three quarter mile distance then you can see the ball basically the this orange ball here uh, you can see it even the lights here you can see the the rest of it clearly but yeah the 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 fresnel lens really focusing so 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 tight uh, but it really magnifying the the light itself so there's several lights here datum light is basically uh, is let's say this is on the platform the landing platform or the flight deck itself showing that either you are high in the cone or in the glide pad uh, the right glide pad basically is very narrow uh, especially getting like a cone like uh, from afar you still can make an error but getting closer to the aircraft uh, uh, carrier it's getting narrow so it's like a cone so if you missed it you basically either too too high or too low yeah and then uh, of course uh, if it's too high you have too much power if it's too low you you have less power basically uh, there's a several others which is a wave of light so if it's lighted meaning that you have to wave off uh, you have to turn around again basically you speed up again and then turn around again the cut lights here basically used when during the uh, radio opera- uh, silent operation so if there's no radio allowed this cut lights will inform you let's say adding power or uh, certain things to do right during uh, during the navigations uh, for for recovery the important one is the ball or mid ball basically you're trying to put this orange really close to this datum light level or slightly above it's okay um, yeah that's the ideal uh, setup yeah so uh, the last one is LSO station here uh, this is landing signal officers back then i think in the old days in world war ii era uh, there's a landing signal officer signaling uh, your you know your correct landing pattern or uh, the glide slope uh, but they're using a pedal real pedal like a ping pong bat uh, you know they do a hand signals doing a dance basically trying to to show you you know uh, the right landing uh, pattern or glide slope uh, in this uh, today's era of course it's electronic using the FLOLS and uh, radio communication but uh, sometimes they call the f- uh, phone set or the headset pedals and the, uh, the LSO is hand um, holding a pickle button the pickle button uh, they will press if your uh, if the landing uh, landing uh, or the, if the flight deck for landing is not safe or fold uh, so they will press that and you have to go around basically a wave off uh, or if your uh, approach is not correct and they will also doing a, uh, uh, they will press a pickle button uh, signaling you to wave off so this is very important one so if you if you get a lot of wave off basically you no, you're not good right I, I read in the article basically you uh, the LSO will grade you after the flights and and show your score in a, in a scoreboard in the galley or in the in the lounge so everyone can see and uh, another one actually there's a TV actually showing your landing uh, uh, mishap for example that's going to be very embarrassing and you want to be they call it the the bolter king <laughs> the one who's always get a bolter basically. So yeah, this is the uh, Fresnel lens optical landing systems uh, in the in the port side, just be just off of the bubbles, the waste bubble. Uh, so this is the datum light. This is the mid ball uh, or the ball uh, track light, and this is cut lights and the wave of light. They have a backup system also if in case this is uh, not working. So this is the LSO and LSO station. Usually six of them, white shirt, uh, white uh, vest. Uh, usually, so uh, they have a squadron LSO 
and Airwing LSO. Squadron LSO only can land a similar aircraft in their squadrons. So basically, so most of them are either pilots or, you know, used to be a pilot, a very senior one uh, who understand, you know, how to land properly uh, or, you know, they can guide you if you have emergency situations when trying to recover uh, into the aircraft. So this, uh, this guy is very important. Uh, you can save your life, basically. Uh, Airwing LSO are higher than Squadron LSO because they can land almost any airplane that can land in the aircraft. So they must be, uh, he must be experienced uh, handling several aircraft, basically piloting, already have a pilot experience for, let's say, E2, Hawkeye, S3, for example, or any other uh, jet fighter uh, that usually land in the aircraft. Uh, so that's important to note. 